What an incredible complimentary word that God is giving to the house in totality. Luke, the first chapter, verses 11 through 17. When you find it, will you say amen? Okay, I'm going to read it to you aloud as you read along with me silently. It simply says, Then an angel of the Lord appeared to him, standing at the right side of the altar of incense. When Zechariah saw him, he was startled and gripped with fear. The angel said to him, Do not be afraid, Zechariah. Your prayer has been heard. Your wife Elizabeth will bear you a son, and you are to call him John and he will be a joy and a delight to you and many will rejoice because of his birth for he will be great in the sight of the Lord he will be great in the sight of the Lord let me back up and read that again many will rejoice your wife Elizabeth will bear a son and you are to call him John and he will be a delight to you many will rejoice because of his birth for he will be a great in the sight of the Lord. He is never to take wine or other fermented drink. and He will be filled with the Holy Spirit even before he is born. Thank you, Lord. He will bring back many of the people of Israel of the Lord their God, to the Lord their God. And he will go on before the Lord in the spirit and power of Elijah to turn the hearts of the parents to their children and the disobedient to the wisdom of the righteous to make ready a people prepared for the Lord. God, give me preaching power. I can't do it without you. I need your help. I need your strength. I need your healing in the name of Jesus Christ. I need you to do a miraculous and marvelous work through and in me. Let the words of my mouth be acceptable and pleasing in your sight. Do not allow it to fall on deaf ears, but unstop our hearing that we might hear clearly. Give me an anointing and a grace that makes preaching easy and listening even easier. And let it, God, arrest our hearts that our behaviors would come into alignment with your righteous word. And be glorified. That's really what we want. Let your glory fall, be magnified, manifested, and revealed in this place. That your glory, God, is undeniable, unstoppable, and immovable. God, let us be changed from the inside out. Let us be better. Let us be helped. In Jesus' name, we declare victory over every distraction, every hindrance, every sickness, every ailment. God, all the confusion, all the disillusionment, all the hopelessness that has arrested our lives, we bind it in the name of Jesus Christ. And we give you glory, honor, and praise in advance for what you are about to do in us, with us, to us, for us, and through us. In the name that is above every other name, the name that can, that shall, and that will, we rejoice and give your name praise. And let every victorious heart, I don't want you to play with it, but I need everybody that's expecting victory in every area of your life, that's expecting God to speak truth to your dead situations, that they might breathe and live again, that's expecting signs, miracles, and wonders, expecting hopes and dreams to be revitalized. I need all the redeemed of the Lord. I need the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus that is in this place to open up heaven by rejoicing in advance. God inhabits, he lives in the praises of his people. Somebody magnify him. Make him bigger than he was. Make him bigger than what you're against. Make him bigger than what you're up against. Come on. Magnify him. Glorify him. Honor him for just being your God. Don't wait on your neighbor, but go for your household. Bless him for what he's about to do in your family, in your finances, in your circumstance, in your situation. Don't wait on somebody else to get it, but you already get it. See what you cannot see. See it by faith, not by what it looks like. Somebody praise God on the level of your expectation. Praise him because you believe he's capable. Praise him because you believe he's able. Bless him because he is God. Thank him in advance. Lift him in advance. Honor him in this place. Reset the atmosphere of your road. Change the dynamic of your health. Change your situation and your circumstance. You can't do it with a pity pack. But God needs you to open your mouth because the power of life and death is locked up in your tongue. You shout more than this at a basketball game. You shout greater than this at a football game. Somebody ought to shout because he is God. Shout unto the Lord with a voice of triumph. Shout like you won. Shout like you've got victory. Shout like it's in the bank. Shout like your name is on it. Shout like your children are saved. Shout like he's about to do something magnificent in your life. 
Glory to your name, oh God. Hallelujah. Glory to your name, Jesus. Glory to your name, oh Jesus. There's a sweet, sweet spirit in this place. Somebody came with a spirit of expectation and anticipation. I'm looking for a miracle. And I expect the impossible. Let everything that has breath shout glory. Come on, let the redeemed of the Lord shout thank you, Jesus. And if you really love him and know who he is, shout hallelujah. You may be seated in the presence of our incredible God. And on your way down, tell your neighbor, neighbor, you don't know it yet, but you're carrying something great. I'm excited for you because you can't even see it for yourself. But you are carrying something great. Tell somebody on the other side because that other neighbor didn't really, they didn't appreciate you talking to them. So just brush them off and talk to the other person. I ain't going to talk to you no more. And say, neighbor, I'm convinced you're carrying something great. Now, some of you are either, you're either lying or you don't have enough faith to believe what you just prophetically spoke. Because if you really believed it, you would not be so calm about it. Because if you really believed it, you would be excited on behalf of the other person except that you're wrestling with your own insecurities, insufficiencies, and lack of faith. But when you know who God is, when you know what God is capable of, when you've seen what God has done before, you don't mind speaking into somebody else's life because you know the same God that's about to birth something great in them is the same God that will birth something great in you. I don't have to be selfish or stingy with my praise because I know that while I'm praising God for your house, he's already showing up at my house. I wish I had some unselfish saints that didn't mind blessing God for what he was about to do for your neighbor. Tell somebody beside you, this is a contact blessing. I'm high off of your blessing. I'm high off of your grace. I'm high off of what he's about to do in your business. I'm high off of what he's about to do in your life. This is a contact blessing. I know you don't know how to shout, so I'm going to shout Take about 10 seconds and make somebody around you uncomfortable. Shout like they're about to get what you want God to do in your own life. Praise God on another level. Somebody ought to be excited. Well, sir, I'm glad for you and I'm glad for you. I'm glad for your kids. I'm glad for your house. I'm glad for your new car, your new increase. I'm glad for your healing, your promotion. I'm glad for the shift in your life. I'm glad for your business. Somebody ought to bless God in this place. You're carrying something great. I don't know why he had me speak this prophetic word over your life, but you're carrying something great. You're carrying something great. You're carrying something great. You are a host to the most high God. You're carrying something great. You're carrying something It's greater than you ever thought greater than you could imagine it's greater than you've ever dreamed he says my thoughts are not your thoughts my ways are not your ways as high as the heavens are from the earth so are my ways from mankind you can't even fathom imagine or think on God's level because he already sees for you things that you can't even dream of in your own capacity he says let me tell you how I know the word of God says I'll bless you exceedingly that's above your expectation. Abundantly, that means you're going to have more than enough. Above all that you can ask or even think. So you mean to tell me that the house I saw for myself? 
You mean to tell me that the dreams I have for myself are nothing in comparison to God's dream for me? That's how I know by sure, for sure that you're carrying something great. It's got to be better than you think. You're carrying something great. It's going to be more than you've ever imagined. More than you ever asked for. More than you qualified to have. Come on, somebody. That's why your testimony comes at the conclusion of a test. Because there's got to be something that you couldn't do in your own strength. If you could do it, you didn't need God. And he says, my glory shall I not share with another. I won't let you take credit for what I'm about to do. So I got to do it on a level that you can't do in your own strength and your own capacity. I'm obligated to outdo myself. I'm obligated to blow your mind. I'm obligated to cause you to stand there and scratch your head trying to figure out how you got out of it. Now I feel like now I'm working against some bougie saints. I don't know why I feel that spirit in the house right now, but some of y'all need to take the price tag off and remember that if God hadn't done what God had already done, you wouldn't be sitting in the sanctuary right now. Somebody needs to bless God because you know his credit is good. Tell somebody beside you, God is about to birth something great. something great it's a new season it's a new day it's a new level it's a new moment new dispensation of time it's a new grace it's a new anointing it's a new thing God is doing in my life behold all things have become new old things are passed away everything that he's about to lead me into has nothing it's nothing in comparison to what I came out of because what I came out of pales in comparison to what he's about to bring me into how do you know pastor I'm so glad y'all asked because he says my ladder shall be greater than my former that means every day in front of me has to be greater than every day behind me that means the new circle of friends i'm about to walk into have to be greater than the ones i had to leave behind that means the new job that i'm about to take on has to be greater than the one i got to leave behind that means my new business has to be greater than the one i have to let go i wish i had somebody that understands God is birthing something great. He's got a great work that he wants to do in you. He's got a great work that he wants to do through you. And anybody that knows that you've got a great God that does great things knows that God deserves a great praise. Uh, slap your neighbor until they wake up. And tell them, now, I ain't going to keep telling you this all day. You're going to need to get this right now. You're carrying something great. Okay, let me help you. Ooh, I'm up against, there's a tough wall in here today. I'm coming through it though. I'm coming through. Take two seconds. Some of you may need five, it's big. Some of you may need 10, it's enormous. Take 10 seconds. And think about what you want God to do. Put it there. Come on. You got something. You got something. It's something you need and want God to do. Something. Something that you want God to do. Think about it. Something that you want God to do. Okay, you got it? You got it. Okay, I need you to think about that times 10. And put that in your mind. Come on. Come on. I want God to do this times 10. Put that in your mind. Okay. Now take the times 10 and do it times a million. That's, come on. Keep going. That's what I want you to do, God. Times a million. Times 10 times a million times... Okay, now I need you to take that times a million and blow it up and do it times a hundred billion. This is what I want God to do. This is what I want God to do. All right, take that a hundred billion and whatever it is that you wanted him to do, that's times 10, that's times a hundred million, that's times 10 billion, a hundred billion. I need you to understand that we can go to infinity. 
Affinity is eternal. Affinity has no ending. That's what I want God to do. I need you to see how it just blew up. I need you to see how it expanded. Now, here's the problem. The problem is, and it's a good problem to have. I hope you got the same problem I got. But here's the problem. As eternal as it is, as infinite as it might be, a hundred billion, a hundred million, it still does not qualify on the level of God's set expectation for your life. Because the fact that you could think about it means that God has already stepped outside of it, superseded it, and he's going to another level. Push them this time. Let us just let the weave shake just a little bit. They wanted to do that anyway. They've been waiting to flip it all Sunday. It's Mother's Day. Just tell them you're carrying something great. Now, here's the tension in the text. You're carrying something great. There's no doubt about it. There's evidence of it throughout the scriptural text. The word of God gives indication that God desires for us to prosper and be in good health even as our soul prospers. Jeremiah 29, 11, for I know the thoughts that I have for you, says the Lord, not to harm me, but to prosper you, to give you hope in the future. So it's no doubt that you're carrying something great. He promised I'll do it exceedingly abundantly above all you can ask or think. He said, I'll even cause people to bless you. He said, your enemies will bless you and they won't even understand why they got to bless you. He said, I'll, I'll call, cause men to pour into your bosom and you'll have it pressed down, shaken together and even running over. He says, I'll bless you. I'm going to blow your mind. You're carrying something great. It's something that I've purposed you, but even before you were formed in your mother's womb, I created you with a purpose. You began with a thought. There was a problem in the earth that you were created to solve. It's something that God uniquely designed you to meet the need of in the earth. And some of you wander your whole lives trying to figure that thing out. But you can't figure it out apart from the thing or the, the creator of the thing. If you really want to know the purpose of a thing, you've got to go search the mind of the creator of the thing. The problem is you've been trying to find purpose in passion. You'll never find purpose in passion. You have to find purpose in the mind of the creator. Are you with me? Now, you can be passionate about the creator, but apart from the creator, you'll never find purpose because purpose is not found in passion. There's a lot of people who are passionate about singing, but you can't do it. Come on, somebody. You're passionate about it, but you'll, it's not your purpose. It's not the one thing that God has uniquely designed and created you to change the world with. So the moment that you start walking in purpose, you'll start, for being the, you'll start seeing the fulfillment of God's plan in your life. And when God starts fulfilling his plan, you will then birth something that you've been carrying to present to the rest of the world. Something that you're carrying, something that you're holding on to, something that has been inside of you for a long time. Some of you have been... You've been carrying this thing so long, but God sent me as a midwife to push that thing out today. You're in the ninth month. You know, the ninth month gets miserable. <laughs> I remember my wife's ninth month. We'd be walking and she'd just say, oh, I feel faint. Ninth month, she was ready. My son, they were both scheduled cesareans and... Uh, my my young my oldest son couldn't wait to come out. He was early. My youngest son was chilling. <laughs> Y'all gonna have to come get me because I ain't going nowhere. <laughs> By that time, she was ready for him to come on out. Understand that some of you are in the ninth month. You're carrying something great, but here's the challenge. How do I? carry something great and I don't know that I'm carrying it. It's one of the most frustrating things in the world to be carrying something great and you can't see it. Everybody sees it but you. And then there are some who don't want you to see it because they don't want yours to be greater than theirs. Can I just preach like I feel it today? The devil's in trouble because I didn't write down a whole lot of notes. This is the Holy Ghost here. I'm on Holy Ghost autopilot. First thing in the world is to have people around you, people in your corner, people that are surrounding you that don't want you to birth something great because yours greater might be a little bit greater than theirs is. 
And it's frustrating because you go through a barren season. Here's Elizabeth. Elizabeth is now in, in a season of life where she has lost hope and she feels utterly helpless as it relates to having children. She has been barren all of her life. She doesn't have any children. And in the cultural context of where Elizabeth was, you've got to understand what that really stands for. Barrenness, not being able to bear children, the inability to birth a child was looked upon with disdain. And there was great shame that was displaced upon them as a result of their barrenness. So being barren was not in itself just enough, but she had to also deal with the disdain and the disregard of other sisters in society who had multiple children perhaps or a plethora of children to leave as a legacy into the earth and many of them had even born sons which were considered the extraordinary favor of God or the blessing of God. So from a cultural context, sisters, you all know, y'all can be cruel to one another. You can imagine how she felt going to the, the Christmas party. And everybody's talking about what they're doing with their child. and uh, Walking by the park while all the mothers are outside and they have their children out playing. And she has to walk by feeling like less than. Feeling isolated. Feeling by herself. Feeling like, what's wrong with me? She was barren. It wasn't just a physical barrenness, but it was an emotional barrenness. She was barren. She was empty. Who knows how many nights she had to stay up crying, pacing the floor. Who knows how many nights she actually prayed. Remember that God told her husband, Zechariah, when he went into the temple, that your prayers have been answered. The angel's announcement was your prayers have been heard. But how long must it have been? The theologians conclude that she, she was well up into, into her past her childbearing age, which means that she was probably in her 60s, 70s, or even perhaps her 80s. And how many times has she prayed prior to this? God, please, I need you to make my womb fertile. I want to have a child. I'm, who knows how many times she had believed God for it. She was barren physically. She was barren, emotionally, empty. Nothing more distressing than praying and 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 it seems like God is not even listening. I don't know who else has been there, but there have been moments when I've had to say, God, is this on? I've been asking for this. I've been faithful, been showing up preaching and singing and worshiping and dancing. I've had a phenomenal opportunity to be obedient to you, and I still don't have what you promised me. She was barren, physically barren, emotionally barren. And after you pray so long and you don't get a response, it'll cause you to become spiritually bankrupt. The enemy will use that opportunity to wear you completely down to the extent where you stop praying because you start asking yourself, what's the use? It's not working anyway. I've been asking for God to bring me out of this and I'm still in it. I've been in it for 30 years. What's the use? I've been believing God, and I know the pastor told me that I needed a hope against hope. I, I did everything that he instructed me to do. I've been faithful. I've been diligent. I've served. I've sacrificed. I've given my life. I've done everything I know how to do, and God is still not responding. What's the use? The enemy will use those moments to speak doubt into your spirit because he realizes that if he can wear you down in that moment, it will disconnect you from the power source. Because Hebrews 11 and 6 says, without faith, it is impossible to please God. And so he wants to get you into an impossible situation where your life is no longer pleasing to God so that he can then disconnect you from the capacity to bring glory to God. And I just want to encourage you with this right here. God will sometimes allow things to get to the point of complete and utter human depletion. 
so that he can utilize his authority and his power to implement divine completion. So the reason he allowed it to get as bad as it is is so that he could show up at the ninth hour, ninth month, and birth something that the world thought would never take place in your life. Oh, I see I got a few testimonies in here. Mothers, I, I love the way y'all said it. When I was growing up, they would say, he may not come when you want him. Oh, y'all knew the same thing. But he's always on what? It's always on time. Mentally, emotionally, and spiritually, full of shame, full of hopelessness, full of helplessness, and it probably at some point even resolved to end in complete failure. Why does God allow barrenness to hit our lives? Why does he allow us to go through seasons of emptiness? Two reasons. One, if you look at the historical record of the Bible, you'll note that he did this when it was an act of judgment. That he would dry things up to show his disapproval with certain areas of people's lives, their nations, their countries, or their actions. So he would allow barrenness to hit the land as a means of judgment. But the other reason, if you look at the historical record, the scriptural record, you'll find that he allowed things to get to a place of barrenness is because of timing. Some things you're praying for you don't have simply because it's just not time. Some things it's not for you, but other things it's just not time. James 4 and 3 says this, you ask and you do not receive because you ask amiss that you may spend it on your own pleasures. Sometimes he dries it up because it's not for you and he knows that what you'll use it for is not for his glory. Oh, I'm preaching good to myself. And other times he just has to declare it's just not time. It's not that it's no, it's just not now. It's not that it's never, it's just not yet. Ecclesiastes 3 and 1 says, for everything there is a season and for every activity there is a time. Everything under the heavens there is a time and there is a season. And so just because it does not happen and has not happened doesn't mean it will not happen. It just means that it's not time. And so in the fullness of time, at the appointed time, at the assigned time, at the appropriate time in due season. God did allow Elizabeth to get pregnant. He visited first Zechariah in the temple. Zechariah went in to pray as he was assigned to do. And when he went in, he had an encounter with God. God sent an angel to send this birthing announcement to Zechariah. Zechariah, first of all, don't be afraid. You got to know that an angel was a, an, it was not the pretty winged angels that we currently know in our cultural and our colloquial understanding wasn't this beautiful little creature with these two wings that, and it glowed and everything was white and, and, and flowing. An angel had six wings. Come on, somebody. An angel was a massive being. An angel was intimidating and even terrifying. And so the first thing that he had to say, and if you notice that when angels appeared, when they appeared to people, the first thing that would come out of their mouths is, fear not. Chill out. It's all good. I'm not here to hurt you. The angel appeared and told him, don't be afraid. Don't be afraid. Don't be afraid. Don't be afraid. He showed up so that today he could remind you, don't be afraid. Because what I'm about to show you, what I'm about to tell you, is so incredible and so next level. It's divinely instituted, orchestrated, and sent to you. Don't be afraid. The angel showed up today. To make sure you knew, don't be afraid. Don't be afraid. Don't be afraid. Pastors are shepherds. They're under shepherds. If we look at it from a literal translation, a literal perspective, they're under shepherds. And the pastors are considered the angels of the house of God. So I came as an angel of God to make sure that you know, don't be afraid. I know it looks scary. 
I know it's intimidating. I know for you it's uncomfortable. I know it's a new place. It's a new territory. It's a new season. But God sent a divine message, a prophetic word into your life about what he's about to do. And he told me to tell you, don't be afraid. Tell your neighbor, I got you. You're good. You're good. And then he goes on to tell him what was impossible. He says, listen, you're going to bear your wife. Elizabeth is going to bear a child. We heard your prayer. God heard your prayer. And Elizabeth is going to bear a son. And you are to call him John. And many people are going to rejoice because he's born. People are going to be saved because of him. And, and, and many people will be happy that he has entered into the world. And you shall call his name John. And so Zechariah, the prophet, the man of God, the one who was assigned and sent into the temple to have communion and conversation with God, Zechariah, who has been with God, Zechariah, who obviously has a relationship with God, had an official position, Zechariah, who sits in the sanctuary, Zechariah, who knows how to worship, Zechariah, who knows how to praise and bless the name of God, Zechariah, who comes into the house of worship and has fellowship and communion with God, Zechariah, who is no stranger to the things of God, Zechariah, who comes to victory, Zechariah, who sits in the sanctuary every single week, Zechariah, who knows what it is to lift up holy hands in the sanctuary, Zechariah, who has a relationship with God, open opens his mouth but the first thing that proceeds out of his mouth is what has invaded his heart the bible says out of the abundance of the heart and some of you don't even recognize that your mouth has deceived your heart because what's coming out of your mouth is indicative of what now is hidden in your heart and Zechariah didn't talk as one who knew who God was he didn't talk as one who had had relationship with God he didn't talk as one who knew the things of God who had a communion with God fellowship with God who understood the ways of God Zechariah talked as one who had doubt in his heart and when he opened his mouth to speak how can this be how can I know you ain't lying Pastor, how do I know you're not telling the truth? Watch what the angel does. The angel silences him and causes him to become mute and declares that for the rest of this pregnancy, you shall not be able to speak. This is how important it was. God says, I can't let you mess up what I'm trying to create with your own doubtful tongue. So I'm going to shut you up so that my purpose, which is so important, can still be fulfilled and your wife can carry what I'm trying to birth into the earth realm. God's purposes are so important that he won't even let you mess them up. When he came out of the temple... He looked so astonished that they knew. They said, you, God done sent you a message. What did he say? Because he could not speak. You got to be careful about killing your own dream. God is trying to birth some things. You got to be careful about denying yourself with what you open your mouth and speak out of your mouth. Power of life and death is locked up in your own tongue. So you got to check your mouth because you can, you can decrease what God is trying to increase. Slap somebody and say, watch your mouth. You must be scared of them. I've seen you all service. You ain't slapped them yet. Next thing that happens is that he comes to Elizabeth and says, Elizabeth, you can't talk. So I'm sure he just made gestures. He had to just make Google eyes, you know. I'm sure Elizabeth, because she was older in age, was probably looking at him, well, what is wrong with you? 
Clearly he knew her. And she conceived a child. But when she got pregnant, the Bible says for five months, she secluded herself. She went into isolation. Sometimes when God is trying to birth something in your life, he has to seclude you. And if you will not remove yourself, he will remove you. Because he understands that there's isolation before elevation. I can't allow the wrong spirits to attach to what I'm trying to create in your life. I can't allow the wrong kind of people to speak negativity and doubt over what I'm trying to birth in your business, in your life, in your dreams. I, I'm trying to birth something that's not just about you, but what I'm about to birth is going to bless millions of people to come. So it's so important to me that if I got to leave, shut some people out your life. I'll snatch you out of their lives and snatch them out of yours so that I can create what I'm trying to create. Because you don't know what you're carrying, sometimes God has to help you help yourself. And it's because you don't believe yet that you're carrying something great. Mary was on the other side of the region and Mary got a similar announcement. Mary... Christ has chosen you. You are highly favored among women. And you're going to carry Christ's child, God's child. And you shall call his name Jesus. And by the way, your cousin Elizabeth, she got a baby coming too. You talking about uh, uh, post-menopause Elizabeth? I got to go see this for myself. She makes her way into the house. And as soon as she gets in, she clearly calls out for her cousin, Elizabeth. Elizabeth! And as soon as the voice carried over into the ear of Elizabeth, the baby in her womb leaped and was filled with the Holy Spirit. Here's the question. Here's the question. I, I, I came here for a specific and explicit person. Are you hanging around people that make your baby leap? Or are you hanging around dream killers, doubt mongers, are you hanging around people that cause you to dream on another level? Or are you hanging around people that cause you to shrink and stay in the same stale, stagnant position? Are you hanging around people that push you into the next level of your promise? Are you hanging with people that's trying to keep you from seeing what God is trying to do? You need to be around people that make your baby leap. I don't know who I came here for, but I want to speak to you right now in the name of Jesus Christ. Thank you, Lord, for this prophetic word. God is about to birth some things in this next season that are going to be so incredible that it's going to make everything in your last season pale in comparison. And what he's about to create is not going to be sensible in an earthly realm, but it's going to make sense in God's heavenly and divine plan. What he has put in motion is that your ladder is going to be greater than your former and you need to get to the point where you experience the voice of God speaking through the airways so that it fills you with the Holy Ghost and every dream that is locked up inside of you just got excited. I wish I had somebody whose baby would leap in here and you know you're about to birth something great. Oh, bless your name, God. Bless your name, God. What makes your baby leap? I came to make your baby leap today. You're carrying something great. You're carrying something great. You're carrying something great. This is your last month. It's the last trimester. This is the ninth month. I feel something moving into the birthing canal. 
The baby is just now about to take position. I can see God about to do something that's so incredible, so next level, so miraculous. Anybody that's ever witnessed a baby coming into the world knows that there is a mystery and a wonder as to how God can take a seed and an egg and create something that is so marvelous, so magnificent, so incredible that the mystery of childbirth is still awe-stricken. It's still amazing. Well, whatever God is about to birth, whatever he just pushed into the birthing canal, whatever just took its position is going to be just as mysterious, just as awe just as incredible that when it comes out somebody is going to have to scratch their head and try to figure out how in the world did God pull this off watch this Mary Mary leaves but Elizabeth carries the, the baby to term and then she has the baby his name is John they wanted to name him after his daddy no we need to name him after Zechariah his father Mary spoke up and said no 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 the Lord said, the Lord said that his name is to be John. And as soon as the father signed off on it and said, that's what it is because that's what the Lord said it's going to be. God opened his mouth and he could finally speak. Now, I wasn't there. I didn't see it. They didn't even do a documentary on it. Matter of fact, they didn't even do a lifetime remake of the movie. But I can only imagine that if I've been mute for nine months and I've been watching how something was born that I never thought was going to happen and I'd seen my wife struggling the way that she struggled and going through what she's going through and I'd gotten to the place in my own faith where I started doubting that God was going to do what God could do I can only imagine that after nine months of not being able to say nothing when God released his tongue and let his mouth begin to speak he probably couldn't say anything but thank you God thank you God thank you God thank you Thank you God, thank you God, thank you God, thank you God for everything that you brought me out of, for how you kept me, for how you brought me to a place of faith. Thank you God. I can't speak for him, but I know that's what I would have been shouting. It's the Lord's doing. And it's just marvelous in my eyes. No, I'm done. Here it is. She was full of shame. Hopeless. And she had resolved to fail. Finally got into the place where she had just rested on, this is where I'm supposed to be. And she finally had what God had promised. She had the son that she called John. Now this is what blew me away. If you turn over to Luke the 7th chapter and the 28th verse. Come on, go with me right quick. Luke the 7th chapter and the 28th verse. Luke 7 and 28. Jesus John hears about Jesus in the territory. And remember that John is the forerunner. He is to go before and prepare the way for Jesus. But when he hears about Jesus in the territory, he sends the disciples, he sends uh, his ministers over and says, listen, go find out if that's the one that I'm, I'm out here preaching about. Jesus then has this to say about John. He says, I tell you, among those born of women, there is no one greater than John. Yet the one who is least in the kingdom of God is greater than he. I tell you, among those born of women, there is no one greater than John. What a powerful compliment for Jesus to look at him and his life and say, nobody else born of a woman is as great as John. So let me get this straight. After all the barrenness, all the ridicule, all the shame, all the pain, all the helpless, hopeless moments, all the restless nights of watching other people get what I thought I deserved. After all of this time of being empty, spiritually, emotionally broken, you mean to tell me after all of this time that, that what I birthed is so incredible that Jesus the Christ himself says among women, those born of a woman, nobody else is greater. 
In other words, he was saying what you were carrying that you could not see, that you did not even recognize or know you were carrying, what you were carrying even in your barrenness is so incredible that the Son of God himself has declared that nobody else has ever birthed anything as great. Here's the challenge. Some of you are carrying something that you cannot see right now. Some of you are about to birth things in this next season that are so incredible and you cannot see it right now. Some of you are about to do something that's so next level that God's going to look upon it and say there's nothing or nobody else that has been able to birth anything as incredible, as extraordinary as what you were carrying. But God, how is it that you can say this when I've prayed and I've cried and I've cried and I've prayed and I've struggled and I've wondered and you hadn't answered my prayer? He said, I was already answering your prayer before you ever opened your mouth to make the prayer known unto the heavens. Before you ever knew you had a problem, I had already made provision for the problem I just needed to get your faith to catch up with my promise and the moment your faith caught up with my promise I opened up heaven and allowed God I allowed myself to invest in you something that's so incredible that even Jesus who is the king of kings who is the lord of lords who is the wonderful counselor who is the great I am even he had to step back and declare that there's nothing that has ever been born that is so great as what was being kept carried even when you didn't know you were carrying it that's where you are today he was the cure to barrenness John was the cure to barrenness but he was also the forerunner and he was the one that went before telling everybody about Jesus somebody's coming Jesus is coming and what he's about to birth in your life is going to declare to everybody Jesus is coming God's doing something incredible God's about to do something amazing how do you know? Because look at what he was done in my life. Look at how he took my barrenness and gave me John. Look at how he made a way out of no way. Look at how he opened up my womb and gave me opportunity to birth something else. That what he's about to birth in this season is not just for you. It's for everybody who doubts around you. It's for every child that comes after you. It's for every grandbaby that needs to see through you. It's for everybody that does not understand who your God is. God had to let you go through barrenness because it gave your testimony strength. If you had never had the testimony, if you never had the test, you would never have the testimony. So the reason he allowed you to go through barrenness So that when you came through the birthing season Everybody would have to step back and say I don't know how in the world you pulled that off But the fact that God was able to help you pull it off Is evidence that the same God that helped you do it Is the same God that's about to bring me into it I wish I had somebody in here That would understand you're in your ninth month And that what God is about to birth out of your barren season is so incredible so next level that everybody around you is not going to have to wonder how it happened they're going to have to look and say this is the Lord's doing and it's marvelous in my eyes I just need about a hundred people to give God glory for what you're expecting him to do praise him on the level of your expectation thank him for what he's about to birth in your life lift him for what he's about to take you into somebody's about to birth something in Incredible. Something great. It's something great. No, you gotta praise him on the level of your greatness. It's something great. No, what's coming is greater than that. What he's about to do is greater than that. What he's about to birth is greater than that. It's greater than that. A great God with great blessings, great favor deserves great praise. Somebody give him a shout in this place. Glory, glory to your name, oh God. The one thing that John, John did that caused him to be so great is that John had humility. John was able to say, it's not about me. Somebody's coming that's greater than I. I'm just preparing the way. It's not about me. Yes, he gave me joy and peace and abundance and increase and favor. And yes, he birthed businesses. And yes, he kept my kids. Yes, he's favored my family. Yes, he's, he's increased my finances. Yes, he did all this. But please don't look at me. It's not about me. Somebody's coming that's greater than me. 
the same one that came and has favored and blessed me wants to save you he wants to rescue you from barrenness he wants to rescue you from hopelessness and shame he wants to redeem you unto himself he wants to carry you he wants to lift you and raise you he wants to elevate and increase you it's not just that he does it for me but he was, he wants to do it for you too he died so that he could do it for you too just like he did it in my house he wants to do it in your house just like he does it in my family he wants to do it in your family and he needs you he needs you simply to say yes you mean it's that's it's that easy all i got to do is say god use me yeah that's all you got to do you say god i want to be used use my life get the glory out of my life use my life that somebody can see what you're doing in me and know that barrenness doesn't last always Weeping may endure for a night. Good morning, y'all. Good morning. Joy comes in the morning time. Come on, everybody stand. Lord, I thank you for your word. Thank you for reminding us that you can take the nothingness of our life and still make something incredible out of it. Thank you for the reminder. Thank you for the reminder, God. Because some of us are going through a dry season. We're barren right now. But God, you're able. You're able to do exceeding abundantly above all we can ask or think. So we thank you even now that everything that we've dreamed is not anything in comparison to what you dreamed for us. And that everywhere we're about to go is nothing in comparison to where you're about to take us. Thank you, Lord. Thank you that our barrenness is not going to be our pronouncement. But that, God, you can do greater things in our latter than you've ever done in our former. That what's to come is better than what's been. And thank you for the reminder, God, to shut our mouths. Stop killing our own dreams and our own potential with doubt and disbelief. Invade our heart with your word, which increases our faith. Increase our faith to the extent that no doubt can come and seed itself in our heart. And it will not escape our lips. We thank you, God, that you're already making provision and you're already making a way out of no way that our barrenness is going to lead to abundance. And we promise on the other side of it, when you do it, not if, not maybe, not perhaps, not should, but when you do it, we promise to be humble enough to say, this ain't our doing. God did this. It's the Lord's doing and it's just marvelous in our eyes. And other people can see from the testimony of our own faithfulness that we've got a God who's able and who's willing. Get the glory. That's all we need. Get the glory. Get the glory out of this moment, out of this season, out of this trial, out of this test, out of this pain, out of this emptiness. Get the glory out of it, God. Get the glory out of it and let our life be fulfilled. Let our purpose be revealed, God. Get the glory out of it. Be glorified in everything seen, said, and done. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Somebody lift the praise in this place. Amen. Come on. Come on and bless him.